listener to the Campfire Cult Podcast. From a camper van deep in the haunted woods, I bring you first-hand accounts of chilling encounters with the paranormal. Step into the night and take a peek into the realm where reality and the supernatural collide. My name is Jazz, and I'll be your host. Welcome back, campers. Tonight, we're headed deep into the haunted woods for some more outdoor horror stories. Let's be honest. If you've been listening for a while, you'll notice that these are kind of my favorite types of paranormal stories to tell. To kick off our evening, we're headed back to the 1990s, where a recent college graduate and his girlfriend embark on a spontaneous camping trip that becomes filled with horror. I went camping with my girlfriend back in the late 90s. I think I just graduated college, but maybe it was my senior year. Anyway, we got a little pup tent and super basic camping gear from Kmart. We get on the road and just drive aimlessly. Our whole intent was to spend four days camping in different places and visiting whatever attractions we came across, not really having any destination in mind. The first night, we stop for dinner at some truck stop in Missouri and ask the waitress if there are any campgrounds around. She tells us there's one that's out of business, but people still crash there. We drive there and everything is locked up. You can still get in, but the bathrooms and lodge are all locked and it looks pretty dumpy with a lot of garbage. The place is deserted aside from another couple who set up camp pretty close to the entrance. Being a dog lover, my girlfriend notices that they've got a beagle and she gets all gushy about how cute he is and blah blah blah. I drive around the campground which is laid out kind of like the Olympic rings. We get to the very back of the campground and it's filthy. We actually get a little nervous because it seems like this place is just a haven for drunks, drug addicts, and assholes who come here to party, but no one is here, just their remnants. As I'm driving, I see a little side road that's a bit overgrown. I figure it might be less used and we'd be less visible, so I head down and it's actually a nice little clearing with four or five sites pretty clean and we set up camp. We play card games until it gets dark, and then we just hang out talking. Around 10 p.m., we notice the very faint campfire of the couple we passed earlier. Nothing special, just noticed it and didn't realize we were that close. We head into the tent and proceed to get frisky. Suddenly, I hear a dog barking. It's not just a random bark. This dog is barking like crazy, barking out of fear. Then, we hear a woman start screaming. Next, we hear a male voice yelling, but we can't make out the words being said. Okay, frisky time is definitely over, the argument continues, and we're trying to make out what's being said. Then I hear a twig snap somewhat nearby, not close, but not far either, close enough to hear though. All of a sudden, I get this intense feeling of dread. I guide her off and tell her to get in the car now. I grab my clothes and realize she's getting dressed. My heart is racing. I'm terrified. I really feel like someone is coming for me and wants to kill me. I say quietly but forcefully, don't get dressed, just get in the car. She says, I'm not going out naked. Let me finish getting dressed. That's when we hear a guy say, Did you hear that? It was quiet, but it was clear. They couldn't have been more than 100 feet away. Our car was maybe 10 to 15 feet from the tent. I pull the keys out of my pocket and whisper, We gotta go now. I unzip the tent and we run to the car. As I hit the unlock button, the headlights and tail lights come on. There are two guys standing about 50, 60 feet away. They freeze for a second and then start running at us. We jump in the car and as I'm jamming the key in the ignition, they get to the front of the car. I get the car started and I look up to see these two standing there. They're about mid-thirties and look like classic bedraggled hillbillies. One has a big stick in his hand and he's holding it up. I had backed up to a tree so I could only go forward. Keep in mind that my girlfriend and I are buck naked. The dome light hasn't even gone off yet and I hear the one guy say, What y'all got in there? I scream, Move! The other guy comes to my girlfriend's window, leans down and says something derogatory that I won't repeat here. 
I roll down my window about two inches and yell, I will run you the fuck over. Move! The two start laughing, and the guy at the window leans down, and the first thing I think is that he's grabbing a rock to break the window, or he's going to knife the tire. I throw it in drive and tap the gas, hoping to scare him away. Hillbilly with the stick doesn't even flinch. He slams the butt of the stick on the hood, looks positively evil as he looks me square in the eye and yells, You give me all the money you got and you can go. My girlfriend's window shatters. She screams. I hit the gas. Hillbilly rolls up and off the side of the hood, and I'm off. We get to the front of the campground, and there's a classically hillbilly pickup truck blocking the entrance. The couple who were there are now gone. Their car was gone. But their tent is on fire. I quickly scan the entrance area and see a broken chunk of fence, wood ranch fence with the three horizontal wood pieces. I head right for it and get out onto the road. We just haul ass. Maybe a mile down, we see the beagle run limping along the road. My girlfriend stop, screams stop, stop. to stop for the dog. I slam on the brakes after making sure no one was following. She gets out and finishes getting dressed. I'm still buck naked, so I jump out and start throwing on clothes. She gets the dog, and his paw is all bloody. I see headlights coming from way behind and scream, Get in the fucking car! And we're off again. We get to a little one-horse town, and nothing is open. Even the fucking police station is closed. We park behind the police station, and my girlfriend checks out the dog. He's okay, but it looks like someone stepped on his foot, and he was bleeding from around his nails. She wrapped his paw. We kind of rested for an hour or two until a cop finally showed up. We told him what happened, and he actually yelled at us for trespassing. Yes, I guess we did. But seriously? He says he'll check it out and that we should head on back home. I tell him I want to file a police report for my insurance, and he says, I don't have time for that. I have to go see a campground. He just leaves. My girlfriend and I waited until morning and filed a police report with another officer. The first guy never came back and never reported anything, so we left. Instead of finishing our nice little weekend adventure, we drove straight to my girlfriend's mom's house. The dog had a tag, but it didn't have owner information. Just the dog's name, Rookie, and my girlfriend's mom, who had five dogs and lived on a farm, was happy to take him in and he seemed happy to have a bunch of playmates. We looked online to find the owners, but the internet back in the 90s wasn't anything like it is today, and we never found the owners or anything about that campground. And since I'm sure someone will ask, the campground was north or northeast of Jordan, Missouri. I wouldn't go there if I were you, though. Next. On a mountain bike and camping trip, a chilling encounter with a mysterious figure leaves two friends fleeing the wilderness. This still kind of makes me tear up thinking about it, because it was just so creepy and blood-curdling to me when it happened. Me and my friend were on a week-long mountain biking camping trip with all of the supplies we need loaded on our backpacks. First night, we log about 50 kilometers and set up camp cooked ourselves dinner on a fire and all was good. Went to bed in the tent pretty early as we had a long day ahead of ourselves the next day. So while we are lying there, we start hearing howling from a coyote or wolf pretty close to us, maybe less than 200 feet away from our tent. We decide not to go to the bathroom alone or anything in case there's a pack of dogs running around nearby. We both had knives and bear spray and I had a three bar extendo, so we personally weren't all that worried about some wild dogs. We slowly fall asleep and the howling continues throughout the night. We finally wake up after seven hours of sleep. I can never get a full good night's rest in a tent. And we start our fire again to prepare for breakfast while packing the tent up. Keep in mind soon after we woke up, we left the tent and by then the howling had stopped. I didn't think anything of it. Just figured the wolf, dog, coyote had ran off during the night. We got the tent packed up before our water came to a boil and I decided I'd go do my business. I brought toilet paper, so I was going to be in bliss. I walk about 100 feet away and find a nice spot tucked behind a hill with some trees at the bottom and a nice creek going by. Blissful. I drop my pants and pop a squat, and all of a sudden, I heard some slight rustling behind one of the trees 10 or so feet in front of me. I'm looking to make sure nothing's gonna sneak up on me while I'm doing my thing. 
It's funny, that instinct is really hardwired into you when you're in the wild. And sure enough, I see a piece of a leather boot behind this one tree. And above it, I see pieces of green fabric. Nope, time to get out of here. I pulled my pants up without wiping and ran backwards up the hill while still looking at the boot and tree or whatever was behind it. I get to the top of the hill and I'm thinking, what the fuck is he doing? I pull my knife out of my pocket and just stay there to gauge what was behind the tree. I moved along the top of the hill as to get a different angle of the back of the tree. Sure enough, I get 10 or so feet across the hill and can clearly see the boots, pants, which I now realize are camouflage, and the rest of this figure. In my new vantage point, I start to see a camo jacket as well. And as I look up to try and see its face, oh my God, what the holy fuck. He was staring at me the whole time. This creepy old face with black stripes, like a football player, glaring at me and fully acknowledged the fact that I knew he was there. I flared my knife to make sure he knew not to run at me and I yelled for my friend to come check this out. My friend starts running over and the guy just slowly backs off into the trees. My friend gets there in time to see what I'm pointing at, although hard when the guy was camoed top to bottom before the guy slipped out of distance. I explained to him what had happened and we clearly both had an uneasy feeling, so we went to get our shit and leave the camp. We could always cook later, so we put the fire out and fly off on our bikes and after putting 10 miles between ourselves and the camp, the mysterious old creepy guy was out of my mind. We probably only logged 30 miles that day because it was terrible backcountry and we were off-roading. We set up camp for our second night cook and get ready for bed again. All is good. Wake up, do the same routine as the first day, but this time actually shit in peace and we also managed to eat our oats this time around. So we pack up and head off on our third day. We logged even less distance this day than the day before. It was really cliffy dry ground and we used lots of energy used per mile ridden. We only made it about 25 miles that day. In keeping with our cycle, we do the same we had the previous two nights set up camp, ate, and then got ready for sleep. We get in the tent, turn our lantern on for a few minutes just to chat before sleep, and then we hear it again. More howls. Pretty cool, actually. Maybe by now we roamed into another PAX territory. Just go together if we go to the bathroom and make sure to carry bear spray and knives. The howling continues for the hour before we fall asleep. We wake up at the crack of dawn, and to our surprise, the animal is still howling every so often in the morning. Better keep our eyes open. We do our morning ritual and prepare to leave the camp. The dog howls again, but this time I got a good idea of where the sound came from and actually could figure out the rough vicinity of its location. I'm looking up a hill where I thought the dog would be and sure enough, I fucking see those same leather boots and camo slacks that I was talking about earlier. This guy's still staring at me and I noticed the howl was actually coming from him. That just made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, so I hit my friend and told him we are going now. He knew what was going on, so we got our bags and left the fire going and bolted. Sorry, I didn't know if this guy was armed or whatnot and couldn't take the time to put it out properly. We decided to cut our trip short and made the journey back to our houses within the next two days. The rest of the trip was completely uncomfortable because that guy had somehow tracked us through 50 to 70 miles of deep bush without us noticing. Two nights of our trip, he was watching our tent while howling in the distance. So if he wanted to track us again, he probably could. Still creeps the fuck out of me today when I think about it. Who knows what his intent was? Up next, in the remote Rockies in a small mountain town, a group of high school friends embark on an overnight hike only to witness a mysterious bonfire ritual in the mountain's shadowy depths. A few friends and I went on an overnight hike in the Rockies behind our little town a few years back when I was in high school. Our camping site was pretty far up there, and it was getting dark. We got to a spot that was nestled in a grove of trees, secluded from the wind and elements, so we decided to stop there for the night. The four of us built a little fire and ate dinner, then just talked for a few hours. Then, all of a sudden, my friend leaps forward and douses the fire with our emergency water, plunging us into complete darkness. Needless to say, the rest of us were pretty pissed, as there was no reason for him to do this. He quickly shushes us, and we realize he is absolutely terrified. Like so scared, he couldn't even speak or move. The rest of us manage to get a few words out of him, and he tells us to look up on the ridge where we should have been camping at. 
It was pretty far up, so it was kind of hard to see at first, but that sight will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was a fire, a big one, like a bonfire sort of thing. Around the fire were several figures moving in a slow circle. They were humanoid, but not quite, and they had arms and legs like people, but something just seemed different about them that I can't really explain. Almost like the limbs were too long and skinny or something, but maybe not. Anyway, these figures just moved around the fire in a really slow circle over and over again. My one friend claims he could hear them singing something, but I don't remember hearing anything. Importantly, there was one standing off to the side a little ways leaning with his arm on a tree branch above his head. This whole thing really creeped us out, but somehow we were able to calm down and get some sleep. We figured it was a scout troop having a camp with an activity that involved a skit or something. Morning came, and we finished off our hike to the peak, and on our way down we passed the place we saw the figures and decided to check out the camp. It was completely deserted. It was obvious that there had been a fire, and there were footprints everywhere. Inside the fire pit was a small mound of charred animal bones, probably chipmunk, and a pile of four or five rodent skulls that had been burned. Creepy, right? Then we look over at where the one figure was standing. Blood. Not a lot or enough to be of concern, but enough to be creepy. Then we see the tree branch he was casually leaning against. It was well over any of our heads, and I'm over six foot. That would mean that in order for the figure to lean against it like he was, he would need to be at least seven feet tall. Needless to say, we got off that mountain very fast, and I have never been up there again. We called the fish and wildlife rangers and told them what we saw. They said it was probably just a bunch of kids messing around and not to worry about it. It might have been just that, and we let our imaginations run wild, but all four of us swear to this day, we all saw the same thing, and it didn't look like a bunch of kids in the dark. I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, but those mountains still scare the shit out of me, and I will never go back there again. Coming up, returning to his hometown for a solo elk hunting trip near Mount St. Helens after leaving the military, a hunter encounters a mysterious presence that follows him through the shadows of the night, prompting an unnerving race back to his car before darkness fully descends. I was hunting near Mount St. Helens, Washington. This was my first trip back and I wanted to get in some elk hunting. I was so excited to be back home and able to go hunting, which I love. My hunting partner was not able to go with me on this trip, so I was going to make a solo trip, which I've done many times before. I knew the area well enough and was prepared for what it would present. I always take at least three days worth of provisions and survival gear in the way of extra clothing, poncho, matches, fire starter, and other essential items in my backpack. I know that many do not take such precautions when hunting, but I do because once while hunting I got turned around so bad that I spent three days in the woods wishing I had something with me other than my gun, knife, and what I was wearing on my back. On this trip I was going to hunt a power transmission line first. I parked on the logging road and walked about a mile to where I would sit on top of a ridge where I would be able to watch both sides. It allowed me to be able to have a clear shot for over 400 yards in either direction. I'd taken several elk in the same location in various seasons over the years before entering the service. I walked in before the light and reached the spot where I intended to hunt before the sun came up. I was there all day and did not see a thing. This was highly unusual as every other time I had chosen this location. I always saw something. It was more quiet than I remember it ever being. I also had the feeling of being watched but thought it was nothing. About an hour before dark and close to when I would have to leave, I started to hear movement to the right in the woods. It was not the usual sounds you hear from an animal, more like someone walking. I thought that maybe someone else was hunting in this area. I took note to be careful, and not to shoot in that direction should an elk walk out. I never saw anyone else, but kept having that feeling I was being watched. It was just a feeling I could not shake. When I got up to leave, I yelled over and said, I'm coming out now, for God's sake, don't shoot. I said this more as a joke. No one said anything, and there was no more movement from that direction. 
I once again yelled a little louder. I'm coming up, please don't shoot. I started walking towards the dirt road and wandered back and forth between the transmission power lines. I thought it was weird that whoever it was didn't call back to say they had heard me. I got to the dirt road and started back to my car thinking that whoever it was didn't want to make any noise to scare any animals as it was not quite dark enough to stop hunting. But for me, I felt the urge to leave. As I moved down the road towards my car, the sound of walking in the woods started again, off to my right, just inside the tree line. I thought that maybe whoever it was had decided to walk out with me. Whoever it was did not come out of the woods, but just kept paralleling me. I stopped, they stopped. This is beginning to creep me out, so I asked them to come out where I could see them. There's no reply. In a louder voice, I said, Enough's enough, no more games. Get your ass out here so I can see you. Again, there's no reply. I took my gun off my shoulder and locked around into the chamber, keeping the gun pointed in the direction of the area while I heard the walking, but with my safety on. I continued to walk to my car. When I stopped, it stopped. I became worried that maybe this was not human. I began to think that this might be a cougar or a Bigfoot, probably a cougar, but still not a great situation regardless of what's stalking me. What concerned me and makes me think it was something other than a cougar is it sounded like it was walking on two legs versus four. Two very different sounds and nothing in the woods outside of man walks on two legs, except the big guy. And from what I know about cougars, you won't hear them until they are on you. I was also aware that there may be another one on the left side of me. I started to watch all around me. After all, I would rather be safe than sorry. I still had quite a way to go to get to my car and knew it would be dark by the time I got there. I started to jog so I could possibly get there before it was totally dark. The thing to my right started keeping pace with me. I could hear it breaking limbs and what sounded like small trees as it kept pace with me. By this time, I knew it was not a human being because of the way it was crashing through the forest. On two legs. I made it to my car without ever seeing what it was, but I wasted no time in putting things away neatly. I simply threw my things in the car and got out of there as fast as I could without ever seeing it. I can tell you it was not a bear, cougar, bobcat, or anything else that I've experienced in the woods. I cannot say it was for sure a Bigfoot, but because of an experience years prior, I'm more positive than not that it was. Maybe I'll tell that story another time. Next, in the heart of Broome County, New York, in the summer of 2016, three friends find themselves thrust into an otherworldly encounter during a weekend camping trip. It was early June of 2016 in Broome County, New York, and I, along with my two friends, Jamie and Dan, decided to embark on a camping adventure in a local forested area. Unsure of the official rules, we noticed numerous fire pits around, and with a rebellious spirit, we set up our tent, lit a fire, and settled down for a night of conversation. Suddenly, the woods around us went silent. Not even the crickets were audible, and an inexplicable static electricity charged the air. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and it felt like the air was humming. In the midst of this strange atmosphere, a deep bass noise resonated, and a distant light illuminated the entire forest. It resembled the initial burst of a massive firework, but persisted for about a minute before splitting into multiple lights and descending into the trees. The glow lingered in the woods briefly, followed by a sudden gust of wind, and then everything smelled like rain without a drop falling. Confused but assuming it was just a meteor, we resumed our conversation. Around 2 a.m., we decided to call it a night. While Jamie and I retired to the tent, Dan opted to sleep by the fire. About an hour later, Dan shook us awake, claiming there was something big watching our camp. About 50 feet away from the fire, Dan believed it might be a bear, but it stood on two legs, swaying as if observing us around a tree. As he spoke, a horrifying roar tore through the woods. To our horror, it sounded like three or four creatures were approaching the campsite. What looked like upright walking dogs ran up and tugged on our tent poles trying to collapse the tent and retreated into the woods. As if they were playing a sick game or something, Every once in a while, one of them would roar again, run up and pull on one of the tent poles, dragging the whole tent a foot or two. I couldn't believe it was still standing. Then finally, the tent collapsed and we screamed in terror. Once it sounded like the creature stopped, we seized the moment and sprinted towards our truck, hopped in and hit the gas. 
Just as we were about to leave, our headlights illuminated one of the upright dog things on the road. Attempting to speed past it, the creature straightened up and puffed its chest. Standing at an estimated eight feet tall, its dark gray fur contrasted with white fur on its chest. The face resembled a dog, but not quite. Distinctly different from what a Bigfoot is supposed to look like from what I know, the creature remained motionless as we swerved the truck to avoid hitting it. Terrified, we drove down the mountain, parked at a gas company lot, and debated reporting the incident to the local police. Uncertain if we were camping in an unauthorized area, we decided against it. The next morning, we returned to the campsite, only to find our belongings, including the tent and cooler, were gone. We haven't been back since and probably never will. For our final story of the evening, unless you are a Patreon cult member, a military veteran and his friend encounter a mysterious creature deep in the mountains at their very remote and isolated cabin. Let me preface this story with a quick description of my background. I am a retired military veteran with three decades of active duty serving my country and its citizens. I've been honored and privileged to be in command on many occasions during my career and have seen both the bounty of peaceful time and the horror of all-out war. You name it, I've probably seen it and been through it in the U.S. military. I do not write this to impress. I merely wish to state the facts so that you may judge the accuracy of what I'm about to tell you. So now the facts as I know them to be, my first face-to-face -face encounter with Dogman. It was five years ago in 2019, and there have been more since then. My first Dogman experience took place in the Western United States. I have a cabin in a national forest, which is nestled in a beautiful valley located 50 miles up a dirt road at a fairly high elevation and is only accessible from late spring to late fall depending on how early or late the snowfall is each year. Most years it is impossible to get to the cabin from Thanksgiving through Labor Day due to heavy snow and ice on the dirt road that runs up to that part of the National Forest. But four years ago in January, there was no snow. And since it is rare to be able to go there at that time of year, a friend and I decided to risk it and go up for New Year and planned on staying a week or so. We decided that if snow started falling while we were there, we'd retreat from it quickly and drive out in time before the road became impassable and safely make it down the mountain. We launched from the city, got to the cabin around midday, and found there were a few inches of snow on the ground around it. Ever alert for animal tracks and prints, I examined the snow for them. I found bear, deer, cougar prints and something else I was unfamiliar with and had never seen before. I now know that they were dogman tracks. Not knowing what the dogman tracks were at the time I first saw them, I filed them away in my mind as a new experience and a new bit of data. Then my friend and I began powering up and commissioning the cabin, turning on the power and the water and the gas. The cabin has living quarters on one side and a huge garage with two huge aircraft-style hangar doors to slide open. I unlocked and opened the hangar doors about six feet wide. Then my friend and I began unloading the supplies from my Jeep parked in the carport and took them through the hangar and into the cabin proper. As the afternoon progressed, we settled in, restocked the cabin supplies, and cleaned a bit here and there. I never go unarmed into that wilderness, so one of the first things I like to do when I get to the cabin is to lay out whatever weapons I have brought with me on a big table out in the hangar. I did this and checked and loaded all the weapons. I also turned on and stocked the gas-powered refrigerator, which I keep out in the hangar, with some of the food I had brought that needed to be kept cool. Then I returned inside the cabin proper and settled in for an adult libation and an afternoon bullshit session with my friend. After a bit of telling stories between ourselves, I noticed the sun had set behind the mountains and it was beginning to get dark outside. It was time to begin prepping for dinner. I told my friend I would get some steaks out of the fridge in the hangar and went to do so. That's when something completely unexpected happened. As I walked through the door from the cabin into the hangar, I took three steps and froze. I was being sighted by something outside. It was big and staring at me through the open hangar doors. In that split second, all the hair on the back of my neck and arms stood straight up, and I started getting what I call my gut warning. I've only gotten those before when flying into live fire from the ground or when in other combat situations in wartime. 
Yet here I was in the middle of the American wilderness, getting the very same well-known sensation stronger than ever. I was pretty certain that it was not a human. I didn't freeze, but my brain began racing. Instead of walking to the fridge, I quickly went over to the weapons table, picked up a large gauge handgun, checked if it was loaded and stuck it in my belt. Then I picked up one of the already loaded rifles. Once armed, I then advanced towards the open hangar doors with the rifle in my hands. I got to the open hangar doors, I raised the rifle and started appraising the situation through its scope, swinging it to the left and to the right. It was so dark by then that I could see little but vague tree shapes and the blobs of bushes outside in the forest. Then suddenly, as I swung the rifle to the right, the feeling of being intently watched switched off, like flipping a light switch off. I stood there for a bit, waiting for the tingle of my intuitive gut warning sign to reappear. After a little while, the feeling of being watched didn't return, so I closed and locked the hangar doors grabbed some dinner steaks from the fridge and went back inside. Later that night after dinner and KP duty, I armed myself, opened the cabin door and stood in the doorway. As soon as I did, the feeling of being watched started up again, only not as intense as the first time. I stood there for a while and then once again the feeling of being watched switched off like a switch. The rest of the evening I turned the sequence of events around and around in my head but could not make any sense of this creature. It just didn't add up. Could it have been a murderous bear that had gotten a taste for long pig or human flesh? All of these thoughts and more went through my mind as I sat there gazing at the wood stove fire in front of me inside the cabin, and eventually I gave up obsessing about it. I told my friend we should hit our racks, so we turned in and slept straight through the night with no further incidents. You're probably asking why I didn't leave the cabin the next day. All I can say is that I am perhaps a little too stubborn and have never believed in retreat of any kind. To me, that is paying for the same ground twice and you have to remember that I've been going to my cabin for 20 years now and have never experienced anything like being watched or hunted. Not ever. Not even close. The next morning we did the usual shower and shave routine and while having a cup of coffee outside in the carport, the feeling of being watched returned, only it was weaker, as if it was from a distance. As the feeling of being watched returned, I still couldn't make heads or tails of the situation I found myself in, but I was adapting as fast as I could, so I told my friend we would be staying close to the cabin for the duration of our stay. I didn't want to take any chances with this new unknown threat, so I told my friend that I was concerned about bears in the area. My friend took this at face value and agreed to stay close to the cabin and its immediate grounds for the duration of our stay. In the days that followed, I got the sensation of being watched from time to time during the day, but it was always weak and seemed to be from far away. But every time I opened the cabin door at night and stood there looking out into the night, the feeling returned very strong and very close, like it was that very first night inside the partially open hangar doors. I forgot to mention that I have a pair of Generation 3 military night vision goggles. I use these every night when standing at the cabin door, looking for whatever was outside watching us. Each and every time I put the goggles on, the feeling of being watched switched off as I explained earlier. This whole situation was darn peculiar, and I just couldn't explain any of it in a rational way that made sense. All I knew was my training from the past, and that if I stuck to that, then my friend and I would be okay. If I developed a plan for the day, I felt it would be all right. And after all, we had plenty of weapons and food and the procedure I settled on was simple. Don't go outside at night, don't leave any doors open, and stay very close to the cabin at all times. Most of the time we sat in the carport on folding camping chairs just shooting the breeze. Also, keep yourself armed and have extra firearms close at hand, and most important, Never, ever go anywhere alone. By midweek, after being at the cabin for four days, we began to get used to this watcher, because it too was following a set of rules and never came into sight. It stayed a certain distance from the cabin. It made absolutely no noise at any time at night. It came closer and stared at the cabin and waited for me to open the door and look around. 
As soon as I used the night vision goggles, it took off, and so forth and so on. On the fourth day at the cabin, my friend insisted on going on a hike. I sensed that I would have the opportunity to figure out who the Watcher was. I was using my friend as bait for what I was mentally calling the Watcher, but I really wanted to know what this thing was. I figured my friend would be safe with me well-armed and watching them from a distance. So we agreed that he would hike down the dirt road for a short distance and then come back. My friend got ready to go, excited to get away from the cabin for a spell. I armed myself well. I holstered and put a large bore revolver on each hip. I double-checked the load on my AR-15 and slung it in front of me. Then, at the last moment, I don't know why, I slung my old trusty full-auto machine gun on my back. It is what you might call the spoils of war and has never failed me in the past. My friend was ready to launch down the road, and I was just as ready to watch him do so. He took off, and I watched as he walked down the cabin access road to the main dirt road. As soon as he was out of sight, I jogged over to a knoll that had a commanding view of the road and the entire valley, and worked my way into some old growth bushes. From there, I watched as my friend started going down the road, and within an instant, I saw something else just off the road behind my friend. It was big and black and stood upright on two legs, and it was fast. It had a weird, flippy, floppy, zigzagging gait, but it zipped from tree to tree incredibly fast, following my friend as he walked down the road. In an instant, I knew that this thing was the Watcher that had been spying and watching us all week, and it was not a bear. I raised my rifle and tried to see it through the scope. My first glimpse of it was its head and upper body. It had the head of a dog. I swear it had the head of a huge dog. A little stunned, I suddenly remembered my training and lowered my rifle sight to its legs. I saw huge, muscular legs like those you would see on an Olympic heavyweight lifter. Its short, dense black fur became sparse going down to its feet, and those toes had huge, curved talons, not nails. They weren't quite as big as the velociraptor dinosaur talons from the Jurassic Park movies that everyone in the Western world has seen, but they were almost as big and they looked incredibly lethal, like overkill. Lethal in a split second. I took this all in, then I pulled the rifle back up to sight on its head and chest, and it was staring back at me, staring directly at me from about 100 yards away. I got a good look as it stared at me. It had a huge head, I would say, much bigger than a human. It had short, smooth black fur and a huge jaw that was slightly parted. I saw large white canine teeth in its mouth. Its eyes were deep dark red, and as I watched, it started to squint its eyes and really got a good look at me. The longer I looked at it and it looked back at me, my brain tried to compare it to other dogs I've seen in my life. To me, its head looked like a cross between a German Shepherd and a Black Lab, but it was huge. Absolutely huge. I got the sense that this thing was mean and pissed off. I instinctively decided to shoot it. Just as I put my finger on the trigger of my AR and was about to pull it, I was interrupted by the noise of a vehicle coming up the dirt road in the distance. I stopped sitting on the beast for an instant and looked down the road, and then I swung my gaze back to the beast. It was gone. I lowered my rifle and scanned for it, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was running away, faster than anything I've ever seen run. It ran through the trees so fast it was a blur and was running on two legs. Then it burst out of the tree line and went to all four limbs and actually increased its speed. It started going through a boulder field and then took off upslope at such a terrific speed that I remember saying to myself out loud, you've got to be kidding me, nothing runs that fast. I watched as it got to the steep granite mountainside across the valley and it just went straight up it, seemingly floating over the rock. It was so fast and it was gone in seconds. I tried to process what I had seen. As the vehicle came up the road, it was a US Forest Service Jeep with a ranger inside making his rounds for the week. The ranger stopped and talked to my friend down in the road and I watched as they chatted away. Eventually my friend finished talking to the ranger. Then he started up his Jeep and drove off. My friend started hiking back to the cabin when my friend returned to the cabin, it was late in the day. 
and I told them we'd be leaving the next day. Obviously, I walked around outside the cabin, heavily armed after that. A little while later, I noticed the ranger in his jeep parked down at my access road gate. I walked down there to chat, as I've known that guy for about ten years. We talked about nothing for a few moments, and then I said, Hey, have you ever seen or heard reports of a huge dog running around these parts? The guy looked at me oddly and very coldly said, We don't talk about that stuff. Without another word, he started his jeep and drove off as I was in the middle of saying, What do you mean? What aren't you saying? What's going on? I look back up the road thinking to myself what the heck is going on up here. It's never been like this before and so forth. I walked back to the cabin, but I couldn't get the image of that dog face with the red eyes out of my head that night inside the safety of the cabin. My friend chattered on about how good the hike was while I listened absentmindedly replaying over and over in my head the events of that day. My mind kept returning to the image I had seen in my rifle scope and began filling in details that I hadn't noticed in the heat of the moment of that first real look at the creature. I finally got a few hours of sleep and slept in a bit. The next morning I woke up happy to see the daylight and thinking for the first time in my life that I'd be glad to leave the cabin that day. But little did I know our last day at the cabin would turn out to be the strangest one of all. After breakfast, we made a cold lunch for the drive back home. We then started cleaning the cabin interior and decommissioning all of its utilities. We had barely gotten started when we heard barking dogs in the distance. You see, there's a poacher problem in some national parks and forests in the USA. Poachers go out of season without permits and kill wildlife for profit in the area. The prey of choice for these poachers is bears. We call them dog runners. What they do is bring up a bunch of dogs to the forest and let them loose to track down bears. Then the poachers follow the dogs, usually on dirt bikes. When the dogs tree the bears or trap them in their hibernation dens, the poachers then ride up and shoot and kill the bear. Once dead, they cut off the bear's paws, cut out its gallbladder, and then leave the bulk of the bear to rot for the buzzards. The poachers then sell their bear parts to Asian apothecaries who use the ground up bear claws and gallbladder to make aphrodisiacs and sell them for big money. The word around town is that a single bear can make a poacher $100,000. When I heard the dogs and the dirt bikes in the distance, I knew it had to be a bunch of dog runners taking advantage of the dirt road in the valley being free of ice and snow to come up and make some extra cash during the winter. The first thing I did was get on my satellite phone and call the closest ranger station. They know me as I've called many times over the years. When I told the ranger on the line what was going on, he said they actually had a couple of rangers in the general area and they would radio them. But that wasn't good enough to save whatever bear the dog runners were running down right then and there. I thought about what to do and I decided to take my 357 out of its holster and fire a shot into the ground. In the distance, I heard the dog stop barking for a moment and then resume their noise. I then fired the remaining five rounds as quickly as I could into the ground again. That time, I heard the dog stop barking and the dirt bike stopped racing around. I had a couple of quick shot loaders in my pocket, so I loaded another six rounds into my revolver as quickly as I could before the dirt bike could start up again. I fired another six rounds as fast as I could into the ground again. After that, I actually heard shouting in Korean from the dirt bikers. Then I heard sounds of the dogs being cuffed around, and it sounded like they were headed back to their vehicle. Now put yourself in their shoes. Here they were in the back country doing something highly illegal, and all of a sudden they heard shots fired like a crazy person on the loose. Rather than deal with that, they hightailed it out of there. They were actually playing it smart, even though they were doing a really dumb thing running down bears in the wilderness. My friend and I listened to the fading sounds of the dog runners. For a while after that, we heard them stop their dirt bikes, I guess to put them back on their truck. Then we heard their truck or van or whatever drive back down the dirt road. We sat outside the cabin for a while after that. About half an hour later, my satellite phone rang and the ranger on the other end announced proudly, we got them, we got the dog runners. They thanked me profusely and asked me to stop at the station on the way home to make a statement, and so forth. My friend and I sat in our folding chairs in the carport 
and discussed what had just gone down with the dog runners, and I explained what I knew about them. That's when things really got really weird, as if it hadn't been a weird enough week already. First, all of a sudden, we heard a soft sound like a very faint musical talking. It was very soft, very seductive, with little tweets and clicks and what sounded like little bells and whistles. At the same time, it was a very dense noise and seemed to be coming from the east of the cabin. It was the kind of noise that just begs to be followed and investigated because it is so beautiful and you just have to know what's making it. Okay, with no other way to describe it, I'll call it fairy music. Then it started to the north, then to the west. At that point, we got up from our chairs, which were facing east, and walked over to the west side of the cabin. Then it started coming from the south. It was all around us. We were surrounded by these ethereal sounds from beyond that were more beautiful than anything I'd ever heard before. My friend took a step forward and said, let's go see what's making that beautiful sound. But something inside me snapped and I said out loud, absolutely not. And I fired my revolver into the forest to the west. And the instant I fired, the fairy music ended. I got my instinctive gut feeling that was warning me something was terribly wrong that we had to just avoid it. By that time, I had enough of all these weird shenanigans. I told my friend that we needed to get the heck out of there. I finished packing the Jeep and got ready to launch from the cabin. I locked the cabin up and we sat for one last time in the folding chairs, looking out to the east at the forest and down the hill to the dirt road winding through it. All of a sudden, a loud whine started from down in the direction of the road. It was loud echoing around the valley and it sounded like a huge dog in mortal, life-threatening pain, like it was dying right then and there. It didn't stop. It went on and on. Then it changed to a howl of rage that went on and on, and morphed into an all-out roar of furious, pent-up frustration, and finally ended with an abrupt yelp. I had my handgun out the instant the howl started. As it ended, the echo began dying around us. I fired one round towards the road and another howl started up to the north of us, a little less loud from a further distance away. I fired another shot in that direction and it stopped mid-howl. Another howl started to the south, also further away, and I turned and shot in that direction. The howl stopped. There were three of them, a pack of werewolf-like creatures, and they had us pretty much surrounded. All of a sudden, my friend said, that sounds like a dogman. I said, what the heck is a dogman? but I knew the instant that I uttered those words that Dogman was its name, or at least the name people give to that beast. We rapidly got in the jeep and left the cabin and nothing else happened on the long ride back down the dirt road. Of course, we talked nonstop about Dogman and recounted the experiences of the week to one another. When I got back to the city, I began researching Dogman on the internet. At first, I found very little real information. Remember, this was five years ago, when my first Dogman encounter happened. Since then, much more has come out about this beast, and encounters with it have substantially increased in just a few years. From the woo-woo wackadoodle New Age nut jobs claiming Dogman is just a poor, lonely little critter that only wants to be loved, to people who have been actually hunted by Dogman. The stories abound, and there seem to be more of them each and every day. In the end, after being hunted by a small pack of these creatures for a week in the remote wilderness, I have some final words about Dogman. It is absolutely real. How do you think werewolf legends got started? Consider that all legends start as real and factual and they get glorified as time goes on. All legends start with the kernel of truth. Dogman could well be the creature that began the werewolf legends. Dogman appears to be poised at the top of the food chain in the wilderness, and is the apex predator on land, much like the great white shark or the orca killer whales are in the ocean. But Dogman is almost completely unknown by mankind. Dogman is not exactly an animal, and it's obviously not a human. It is something in between. It is supremely intelligent. It has a huge brain case from what I saw of its head through my rifle scope. It is much larger than a human skull, Dogman and its packmates plotted and planned and waited for an entire week to catch me and my friend with our guard down and was finally thwarted. This beast is very intelligent and it watches, waits, and plans. It was obviously aware of the power of firearms. 
Even so, after hearing and watching me discharge my sidearm multiple times during the dog runner incident, it somehow manifested the beautiful music to lure us away from the cabin and our cache of firearms. I will close this story now with these final words. Please remember, Dogman is not evil because it is a predator and preys on other animals. Dogman is evil because it can plot and plan to kill, like it did with me and my friend for an entire week. It didn't need me for meat or sustenance. It did it because it thought it could win. It did it as an exercise. Anything that kills for so small a reason does so simply because it can. This seems to be one thing that it shares with the most evil of humans. Similar to the dog runners chasing down and killing bears, only for a couple paws and organs, leaving the rest of it to rot. That is evil in its simplest form, dogman or not. Wow, what a story to end the free portion of our episode. For our Patreon cult members, I've got a few more tales to keep you at the edge of your seat. If you want to become a Patreon cult member to get extended episodes and other free Patreon-only episodes, you can sign up at patreon.com slash campfirecultpod for only $5 a month. Until next time, I'll be leaving you in the dark where whispers linger and shadows dance. Stay wary, sleep well, and beware the whispers in the night. If you have a story to tell, please reach out via email at contact at campfirecultpod.com or leave me a voicemail message at 720-297-8608. You can follow us anywhere on social media at Campfire Cult Pod and online at campfirecultpod.com. And finally, if you don't mind, please rate and review wherever possible. 